Welcome back everyone. So today we'll continue our discussion on optimization. So um, last class, we actually spent quite a long time talking about many aspects of optimization, um, focusing on the different optimization algorithms. We began with gradient descent. We saw some examples of how gradient descent worked um, through, some, uh, through a few different animations. For example, we looked at the step size, we looked at convergence guarantees, and we also looked at what happens when the function, um, when the objective function is not convex. Okay, so um, not convex, and sometimes even when the function, um, when the function only has one local minimum, which is the global minimum, um, bad things could still happen. Then um, we proceeded to look at other variations of iterative optimization algorithms. So that included momentum, where the gradient controls the speed instead of the position. So the gradient is basically acting like, a, like an acceleration. And then we also looked at Nesterov's accelerated gradient. Um, then we did one example where we had a convex function, but then the convex function was actually um, the, the gradients, the, I guess the gradient sizes were very different depending on the direction. So um, mathematically, basically that means that our Hessian matrix has eigenvalues that are very, very different from each other. And we saw that um, in this case, um, regular gradient descent would have a lot of trouble converging to the minimum quickly. But, um, but then we not noted that, okay, what if we rescale the function? If we rescale the function, then we can actually optimize um, or find a minimum very quickly. So that led to optimization algorithms that use preconditioners. So these were adaptive gradient or adagrad, Adam, which is basically adaptive gradient with momentum, and finally Newton's method, which allowed us to um, have non-diagonal preconditioners. Okay, so that was a lot of different variations, and we also noted that okay, um, depending on the objective function. Um, which algorithm is the best? Well, there actually no, there's actually no best algorithm. It all depends on the objective function. A lot of times, the optimizing algorithm is kind of like a hyperparameter that we have to choose. Okay, but uh, regardless of what, um, regardless of uh, which variation we use, um, everything we talked about previously were actually deterministic algorithms meaning that at least in the way that we presented them, um, there's nothing random about this whole process. We evaluate the gradient, which is a, a de deterministic quantity, and then all of these calculations are deterministic. And today we're gonna talk about um, some stochastic, um, stochastic methods for optimization. Okay, so, so stochastic optimization, sometimes called stochastic approximation, um, is basically um, using some randomness, in our case, using some randomness to improve the computational efficiency. And sometimes even um, the randomness even helps us find the optimal solution. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. We wanted to minimize some loss function L of theta by choosing the best theta. Okay, and this loss function, at least so far, what we have seen is that the loss function is the negative log likelihood, and that turns out to be the same as the square loss. But you could, but you could kind of use any loss function. This this discussion is pretty general. The square loss looks like this. Basically, we're adding, um, we have a sum over all data points, and for each data point, we're going to take the label y i minus our uh, the prediction of our model f of xi theta, and then we square this error. We can also write that as the sum over all data points, i equals to 1 up to capital N of li of theta, where li represents the loss contributed by one data point, by the i data point. So, so now if we're going to do gradient-based methods, um, we will need to compute the gradient of this loss function. So well, because we have a big summation, we can do the gradient term by term. 
Okay, so then it looks like this. Um, actually, this is sort of an issue because in machine learning, sometimes if the data set could be very large, let's say a million data points, um, in that case, n would be 1 million, and then you would find yourself adding a million different terms. And um, so for large data sets, computing the gradient could be expensive. Okay, so it turns out that maybe we don't need to compute the gradient by adding up all the terms. We can actually select a random subset of the terms and add them together. So for example, we're not gonna add up one to n, we're gonna choose two, eight, 10, i equals two, eight, 10, 15, maybe some, some random subset of, uh, of terms to add up. And it turns out that um, this can be viewed as a noisy version of the true gradient. Um, so definitely not exactly equal to the true gradient, but it is equal to the true gradient in expectation. So if we take these random samples, random subsets of terms and add them up, and then we do that many, many times, on average, we would actually be computing the true gradient. So we, we can actually show this mathematically by looking at the extreme case of actually choosing just one term to add, uh, choosing just one term to represent the gradient. So the way we're gonna do that is we're going to use, uh, we're gonna let i prime be a discrete uniform random variable from one to n. So, so the probability that i prime equals to k for any k inside one to n is gonna be one over n. So with equal probability, we're gonna choose a random data point index. Okay, and then we're, and then we're gonna just pretend that the gradient instead of adding all these terms up, we're just gonna pretend that the gradient is simply gonna be a single term here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's write this down. Okay, so normally the gradient equals to summation of i equals one to n of the gradient uh, the gradient of the ith of the ith loss so the loss contributed by the ith data point but instead we're not going to do this because that could be very expensive we're going to pick I prime uniformly randomly. And then we're gonna simply say that a noisy version of the gradient is going to be approximately just the gradient of the I prime loss function, the I prime loss, I prime loss. So, so now I want to show that in expectation, so we're going to take the expectation over this random variable of, of our gradient. So obviously if you do it once, it's not going to be equal. Um, so if you, if you do it once, then basically it's definitely not going to be equal to uh, the overall gradient. So the idea is that we're going to pick an I prime and then we compute this term. And then we're going to pick another I prime and then we're going to compute this term again. So we're going to do that N times because originally there, there might be N terms. So we're going to do this N times. Okay, in general, you may not, you may not, not necessarily need to do it N times. Um, yeah, but for the sake of showing that in expectation, this great, this uh, stochastic gradient is the same as the original gradient in expectation, we'll, we'll just say that we're going to do it n times. Okay. So n is just a constant, so we can move the expectation. I guess move n outside of the expectation. 
Okay, so, so now we, we're going to use the definition of expectation. The definition of expectation is actually summation over probability x equals so summation over all the possibilities of the random variable x. Um, so we sum up probability the probability mass of each and then um, the values um, to, uh, the possible values of x. So that's the definition of expectation. So we're going to apply that here. Okay, so so we're going to pick i prime uniformly randomly from the set 1, 2, all the way up to n because there are n data points and we're just randomly picking one of them. So then that means that uh, the possible outcomes are going to be from 1 to n as well. And then for each possible outcome, we're going to sum up um, the probability that i prime equals one, each of the outcomes and then multiplied by um, multiplied by the thing that we're taking the expectation of. And that's going to be partial, uh, partial li prime partial theta. Okay, so now we can do some simplification because we know that we're picking i prime uniformly randomly. So this probability that i prime equals to k would be one over n. And then we still have this gradient of the ith loss function, the the ith law, the loss of the ith data point. So now the one over n can come outside and cancel with the m uh, with the outside n. So we're now just left with this sum. Okay, so this should be a k here. Yeah, let me fix this. Yeah, so because we're we're iterating, we're kind of summing over the different possibilities of i prime from k equals to one to n. So so this um, gradient here should be uh, it should be index k as well. Okay, so now it turns out that while well, this is exactly the expression for the entire gradient, the gradient of the entire loss function. So if we pick one, if we pick a single i prime and then calculate the gradient of the loss from the i prime data point, then that's not really going to match with our original gradient. But if we do it many, many times, if we do this many, many times, then on average, we get exactly the gradient. Okay, so that's basically what this slide is trying to show. Right, again, we're gonna pretend that we're gonna sample n different i primes. Okay, so then this is a random variable, and then we take the expectation over the random variable i prime. The n comes out, and then the expectation um, kind of gets applied to just the second part. So now um, we can use the uh, definition of expectation here and then simplify based on the fact that we're using the uniform distribution for for choosing i prime okay so now that gives you an one over n that cancels with the n and in the end you simply have all the losses from every data point added together and that just gives us the original gradient so this is a fixed variable and then this thing is a random variable Whenever the expectation of a random variable is the same as some fixed variable, um, we say that the random variable is an unbiased estimate of the fixed variable. So in, in our case, um, the subsampled gradient known as the gradient estimate is actually an unbiased estimate of the true gradient.
Okay, so using that idea, we have the first uh, stochastic optimization algorithm called stochastic gradient descent. So often known as SGD. It looks very much like gradient descent, except that in our update, we don't, um, we don't do the update like gradient descent. In gradient descent, it used to be theta t minus one minus gamma t times the gradient, the full gradient. Okay, so let's go, just go back here. So this was gradient descent. Um, over here, it used to be the full gradient. And now it's actually just the gradient of the loss uh, from the i theta point. So partial li prime, partial theta. And then after computing the gradient of just one term, we're going to update theta and then we're going to iterate. The next time we're going to sample a different, well, potentially a different i prime. So all of this is done uniformly random. And then we're going to calculate just one term of the gradient. So, um, and then we're going to pretend that that's the actual gradient. And then we're going to update theta based on that uh, partial, I guess, gradient of one term. When the algorithm has converged, we return, uh, we return the parameter that we happen to get. So let's compare SGD with gradient descent. So there are two primary benefits of SGD. So first of all, computing the gradient estimate is much cheaper compared to computing the entire gradient. And that's just because we're going to only evaluate one term versus evaluating all n terms and then adding them up. And actually another benefit is that it's less prone to getting stuck at a, at a local minimum or a saddle point because it's basically like a noisier version of the gradient. So when you have some noise in the direction that you're going down the objective, um, a lot of times that can that can kind of get us out, so prevent us from getting stuck at some local minimum or saddle point. So actually, for many, for many non-convex optimization problems, having the randomness um, will actually help us converge to the right, uh, to converge to a better solution. Okay, then there's also a drawback. Um, in in the worst case, we'll need many, many, many different iterations, many more iterations. In order to com uh, in order to converge to the solution we want. So basically, if I go back here, the computation of this term is much cheaper. However, we're doing the subtraction, so we're doing this theta update way more often. So computationally, there's also a trade-off as well. So this is cheaper, but then overall, we're doing this whole thing just as many times. Or sorry. Um, n times as many times. Okay, so that's kind of the main comparison. So some terminology. Um, actually, people don't really do, people don't really use this uh, stochastic gradient descent in the way that it's written here. Um, usually people would use what's called the mini batch gradient descent. So let's go over some terminology. So gradient descent, or maybe the full name should be full batch gradient descent, is the very first gradient descent algorithm that we looked at. So the one where we compute uh, the entire gradient. What we just talked about is called stochastic gradient descent SGD. So this is computing the gradient on a single data point every iteration. So that was this one over here. Okay, but what is actually uh, more common is called mini batch gradient descent. So this is computing the gradient on a subset of data points. So this subset of data points is called a mini batch. A lot of times when people say stochastic gradient descent, what they really mean is mini batch gradient descent because this is the most common version. So the main difference here is that um, instead of instead of having just partial li prime, partial theta, we're gonna add up a few terms, not all the terms. So we don't have a summation from one to n um, for all of these uh, to calculate the gradient, but we're gonna sum over some of the terms. And then the number of terms you add up when calculating the gradient, uh, that's called the mini batch, the size of the mini batch. 
So we talked about how when we do grid, when we do SGD, at least this version, we need to update n times. We need to run run this algorithm n times in order to uh, kind of have the same number of terms being included in the gradient. So what? So this. Uh, so the number of iterations needed to perform one pass over the data set. So in order to achieve n, uh, in order to go over n data points, that's called an epoch. So for full gradient descent, every iteration in every iteration, uh, we have gone through one epoch. For the extreme case, the stochastic gradient descent over here, we will need to do n iterations to um, to go over one epoch. And if we use mini batch gradient descent where M is the size of the mini batches, then we will need to do N over M uh, iterations of theta updates to go through one epoch. So mini batch gradient descent tends to work the best and it's basically what people use. Okay, so this is basically the stochastic version of gradient descent, but we can also apply stochast stochasti stochasticity um, to the other optimization algorithms as well. So for example, we can apply the same idea to momentum. Um, so yeah, uh, the Nesterov's accelerated gradient, Adagrad and Adam. So for all of these, the only difference is that if we just go to one of these methods, let's say Adam, the main difference is that wherever you have the gradient appearing, we actually don't uh, we don't compute the entire gradient by adding up n terms. We select, we randomly select which terms to add up to approximate the gradient. Okay, so all of these um, people would some would sometimes call them stochastic gradient methods. Okay, in machine learning, um, we usually have very large data sets. That's why we're doing these stochastic algorithms. Um, actually, basically, we only use the stochastic, we only use the stochastic versions. So we often don't really say sto stochastic. For example, if I say, can we train the model using gradient descent? Um, if the context is machine learning, possibly with very large data sets, then by default, we mean stochastic gradient descent. Okay, if we use Adam optimizer, by default we're going to be using stochastic Adam optimizer, right? Because by default, the, by default the data sets are very large. So all of these stochastic methods work very well when we replace um, the gradient term with just a subset of the, just by adding up the, a subset of the. Um, gradients for every data point. And this works very well for first order methods, but it doesn't really work, work very well for second order methods. So all of these things above are first order methods. They only require computation of the gradient. Um, second order methods like Newton's method and some other ones that we didn't really talk about yet, um, these stochastic methods don't really work that well. And the reason is that there's actually uh, not a good way of approximating the grade uh, the Hessian, even though there's a good way of approximating the gradient. So the gradient part can be approximated by adding up only a subset of the terms, but the Hessian matrix, um, that one actually, um, that one isn't so easy. Okay, so now um, we have seen many different uh, optimization algorithms and all of them have different hyperparameters. So for example, we have the learning rate or the step size in which appears in all methods. So I've, all, I've been consistently writing down gamma t. That means that depending on the iteration number, we could even have a different step size. So that means sometimes we may need to choose the initial step size we may need to choose a learning rate or step size schedule, maybe sometimes constant step size all the time. Maybe we can have a large step size in the beginning. And then later on, when we have a lower loss, we can lower the step size as well. 
Um, sometimes you can do inverse time, meaning like gamma t equals one over t. There are many different choices. For some of the more advanced algorithms like momentum and atom, we also have the alpha parameter. So that's the momentum parameter. And then uh, for and then for atom, there's also another beta parameter for the preconditioner as well. So usually when we train, when we train a model, tr again, training the model means determining the weights or determining the theta parameters. Um, we have to kind of choose all of these. And a lot of times there isn't really a principled way of choosing them. So this is kind of, from my experience, uh, this is sort of, sort of what I start with at least. And then depending on how things go, I might change the, uh, I might change these hyperparameters. So I, I, I normally start with a constant learning rate schedule. And then I would try to sample all of these uh, different learning rates on a log scale. That means that I'll try 0 0.1 and then 10 times smaller 0 0.01 and then 10 times smaller 0 0.001 and so on. If the objective value keeps going up, like the orange one, or maybe it just keeps going up and down, never improves, that could be a sign of having a step size or a learning rate that is too big. So that's kind of similar to this picture over here, right? If you have, if the objective value keeps oscillating, maybe the step size is too big. And then we can reduce the step size a little bit. Okay, if the objective value goes down, but it goes down very, very slowly, then we're in the other case. So back to this slide again. So objective value goes down very, very slowly. So maybe we can increase the step size. Okay, it's kind of just general guidelines and it really depends on the objective function. So there's no one, there's no one way of doing this that works for every application, every objective value. Okay, if the objective function goes down and then it stops improving, that means that we may have hit kind of a local minimum. So in this case, we can try some step size in the beginning and then we can change the step size. Um, we can change the step size later when the objective value plateaus. Okay. And then if the parameter vector is pretty low dimensional and you're using a stochastic method, you, one thing you can try is the inverse time learning rate schedule. So picking some constant over T. So this one is actually backed by theory. Um, so basically the idea is that when we get pretty close to the, to the optimal solution, we want to have a small step size because we don't really want to move away from, uh, from the optimal solution. So this is a good choice because as the number of iteration increases, the step size approaches zero. That means that eventually we, um, we don't try to change the solution because the solution is already optimal. On the other hand, we don't want the solution, we don't want the step size to go to zero too fast. Um, in fact, we want, to, we, we want to make sure that the sum of all the step sizes add up to, in, add up to infinity. So that kind of roughly speaking, intuitively, it means that, oh, um, we, we are able to learn, we are able to kind of learn as much as possible, as much as possible for finding the optimal solutions. So it turns out that when you have uh, something, a constant over T, this sequence goes to zero, but then the sum of the sequence goes to infinity. So this is actually um, a theoretically sound step size to choose. Um, it may not, it may not converge the fastest, but it's back up by theory. Okay, so that was the learning rate um, or step size. So now the momentum, uh, momentum parameter. So maybe you start with 0 0.9. Again, it really depends, but start with 0 0.9, increasing to 0 0.99 or 0 0.99 if the mini batch size is small. And then the momentum parameter for the preconditioner in Adam, try beta equals 0 0.999. So that's probably, I would say, the first thing that you can try, but you very often you will need to tune these.
um, in some of your other classes. For example, if, if, you're, if you're taking computer vision uh, or maybe natural language processing, you, you will definitely get some experience tuning all of these parameters. And uh, from experience, you will be able to find these parameters more quickly. Okay, so with that, we're done with optimization, and now we're going to talk about neural networks. So let's go back to our um, uh, kind of linear regression model with features. So um, I guess the idea back then was that um, we can actually replace the input data with the feature of the data, and that will allow us to have a model that is non-linear in the input, but still linear in the weights. So, but I guess, so for example, the features could be polynomial features, but the problem here is that we still need to pick the features and the feature map is fixed. Um, how do we know what feature to pick? So the idea of neural networks is that maybe we can learn the features. So instead of replacing, instead of using uh, this phi of x feature function as a fixed function that we pick, we can actually try to change phi into a model that we learn. Okay, so this is basically the idea behind neural networks. So let's take a look, right? So um, previously we had a scalar output for our model. So then we have W transpose phi of x. Now with neural networks, we're gonna be talking about multiple output models. So now the output y is gonna be a vector. Okay, so I think it will help to go through this a bit slowly. Okay, so now our output is a vector. So that means that it's going to be, at least from the starting point of before, uh, with multiple output linear regression, we'll have a matrix W um, times phi of x. And phi of x is a vector representing the features of the input. Okay, so we're going to rename a few things. So let WL equals W. So just renaming some things. And then let HL equal to phi. So now we can rewrite our model as Y hat equals WL times HL. Okay. So now, before, we actually picked a fixed phi function. Uh, so, so, well, let's not do that because we don't want to pick, we don't really want to pick a fixed uh, feature function. So instead, we're going to pick HL to be some other function, Psi, of W sub L minus 1 times X. So basically, this is some function, Psi, which is a function of some some weights w l minus one times x. So then our y becomes our y hat becomes w l times psi w l minus one times x. Previously, we would if we pick a fixed feature, then we would only learn w l from data. Now we make the feature learnable. We make the feature itself. Uh, a function with some unknown weights. So now we can learn, we can learn the feature as well. So when we when we use the data to train our weights, we're actually training both WL and WL minus one. Okay, so that's kind of the first step. Instead of a fixed feature, we're going to replace the fixed feature with, um, yeah, replace the fixed feature with a function with unknown parameters that we can also learn from the, from the data. Okay, so now you may have noticed that we still have an x here. And instead of inputting x, we can always ask the question, well, why don't we input a feature of x? Okay, so maybe how about, right? Instead of x, we can always replace with feature of x. Well, actually, maybe not because because we we don't want to pick a fixed feature. So instead of picking a fixed feature, we're again going to 
going to say, okay, how about a learnable feature? So this is basically a feature function that has unknown parameters. So right, unknown is kind of synonymous with learnable. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. So we're gonna keep going. Instead of X, let's let's replace X with a learnable feature. Okay, so now this is kind of why we introduced some notation for WL and so, so it's basically the in the indices. So now we can replace this with some function psi of WL minus two X, right? So Instead of x, we're gonna do we're gonna replace x with a feature of x that is learnable. So now y would be wl psi of um, wl minus one times psi of wl minus two x. So we can. So now we have. We have a model which is y hat equals wl times a learnable feature. The input to this first learnable feature is going to be another learnable feature. And then the input to that is finally x. But then we can always replace x with another learnable feature. So if you keep doing this, we can always define, we can always have y hat equals to wl times a learnable feature learnable because we have the weights w l minus one instead of inputting x here we're going to input a learnable feature okay now instead of putting an x here we're going to put a learnable feature and then we can keep going until eventually we get to um yeah until we eventually we get to like once once we're finally decided decided that we had enough, maybe we'll get w zero psi of w zero x finally the input, right? And then many many closing brackets afterwards. Okay, so this is actually the simplest form of a neural network. Um, this is called the multi layer perceptron. Okay, so th that's kind of how um, this kind of math works out. Let's just revisit it again. Go back a little bit. So again, for neural networks, the motivation is that we don't want to pick a fixed feature. We want to have these features be learnable. To make them learnable, instead of W phi, we get, the first step was we just kind of renaming W because we know that we're going to have many of these W's later on. So we're going to add an index L to W. So now Y hat is going to be equal to WL HL, where HL is a learnable feature, which is which can be written as psi of WL minus one times X. Okay, so now again, we have an X, so we can always replace X with another learnable feature. So then moving on to the next slide, right? So now instead of X, uh, so, so we have Y equals WL HL, where HL equals Psi of WL minus one X on the previous slide. So while well, instead of X, we're gonna have another learnable feature, which is Psi of WL minus two X. So now when you so now our model becomes y hat equals wl hl, where hl is a learnable feature. The learnable feature is psi of wl minus one, hl minus one, where hl minus one is a learnable feature. And that learnable feature is psi of wl minus two x. And now if we learn, if we try to use data to learn all the parameters, 
we will be we will be learning WL WL minus one and WL minus two. Okay, but again, why stop here? So we can keep going and then eventually so keep going y hat equals wl wlhl hl equals psi of wl minus 1 hl minus 1 and then hl minus 1 equals to psi of wl minus 2 hl minus 2 and then hl minus 2 equals and so on and so on eventually we get to h1 equals psi of w0x so now when you learn um, when you take the data when you use data to learn the parameters the parameters will be all of WL, WL minus one, all the way down to W zero. So on, on the written notes, um, we have written down this more compactly as Y hat equals WL times Psi of WL minus one times Psi of WL minus two and so on all the way down to Psi of W zero X. So this is actually the simplest type of neural network, a multi-layer perceptron. Sometimes people call neural networks as neural nets or artificial neural networks. Okay, so this is basically what a neural network is. Um, if you thought that they were some, some kind of mysterious thing, they're really not. They're just some function of x, although it's a very complicated function of x. But this complexity actually makes sense because it just comes from iteratively saying that, okay, instead of x, we can always put in a feature, a learnable feature of x. And that's how you get a multi-layer perceptron. Okay, so let's unpack a little bit. So this is our multi-layer perceptron model. In linear regression, we had a single scalar output, y hat, right? The, now we have a y vector, but it used to be just y hat scalar equals w transpose x, where w was w1 to wn minus one, and then b, and then x was x1 to xn minus one. So this is the raw data. And then we append a one at the end to multiply with a b in the inner product. So now we can also expand all of this. So x, we can say x equals to x1 up to xn0 minus 1. So now the n0 is, is the n, previously it was called n, but now we call it n0. And then we append the 1 at the end. So now we can compute h1, which equals to psi of w0 um, x. So W is a matrix that multiplies our vector input, and that gives us um, that gives us a vector. So W zero x is a vector, and then H is going to equal to psi of what we call Z. So just to be clear, the thing inside the thing inside here, this is called. Um, this is called Z. And then H is basically applying the, the function Psi on the inside, which is Z. And the function that we apply is going to be some function G to every component except for the last component. For the last component, we leave it and we leave it as one. And our weights are going to be matrices now. So we have um, kind of the W part of it, which gets multiplied to either the X part or the G part, depending on which stage you're at. And then the B, a column of Bs, which will multiply by the one. Okay, so hopefully we can work this out. So the WIJ is known as the weights. BI are known as the biases. And then G is known as the activation function. Sometimes I would just call everything here the weights. But if somebody says biases, then they, they would be specifically talking about the Bs here. <laughs> 
based some terminology. Again, we have our multi-layer perceptron model um, where the output is y hat. The y hat is sometimes called the output layer. Actually, it is called the output layer or the last layer because we have gone through many, many layers. So from the input layer x, we have done many, many operations. Each time we multiply by w and psi, we get we get the next h, and the h is called a hidden layer. So hl is the lth hidden layer. Sometimes the l plus one hidden layer, depending on the convention, um, they might also be called features because h were basically what we thought of as features, learnable features in our previous discussion, and they're also called post activations because h because we obtain h after applying psi. And the psi function is basically applying the function g called activation functions to um, to the first component, to all the components except for the last one. Okay, so many different names for hl, l hidden layer, l plus one hidden layer, features, post activations. And then the z's that we were talking about, which is wl, hl, so that's, be that's what you get before you apply the function psi. They're called pre-activations. Okay, so just a few more terminology to, to end the lecture. Um, so we talked about what these vectors mean, right? sorry, the, the names for these vectors. So now we're gonna drill down and there are, there are also names for the individual elements of these vectors. So an element of Y, H, L, or X is known as a neuron or maybe a neural unit or maybe just a unit. The input neuron or input unit refers to an element of X. A hidden neuron or hidden unit refers to an element of H, L for any L. So all of the, doesn't matter what L is, doesn't matter which layer you're in. Um, if you're in a hidden layer, an element of that would be a hidden neuron. And finally, an output neuron or output unit is an element of the output y hat. Okay, so that should give you a basic idea of what a neural network is, and in particular, what the most basic version of it, the multi-layer perceptron is, and all the associated terminology. So we're going to continue our discussion of neural networks next time. So uh, have a good weekend, everyone. I'll see you guys next time.